Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Quality Assurance and Quality Control Monitoring in Liquid Chromatography Mass Spectrometry Service. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Waters Corporation. To learn more, visit them at waters.com. Now, we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you might have during this presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. I'd now like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Richard Kinting Kam from Department of Chemical Pathology in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Dr. Kam obtained his PhD degree from the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2011 and was responsible for managing proteomics laboratories in different institutions until 2013. And since 2014, he was a staff in charge of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics laboratory, providing on-demand bioanalytical service in support of clinical trials. <clears throat> Currently, he holds the position of scientific officer in the Department of Chemical Pathology at Prince of Wales Hospital, and he is responsible for providing LCMS-based clinical proteomics service with emphasis on inherited metabolic disease investigation. Dr. Kam, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. All right. So uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, my name is uh, Richard Kim. I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, in this presentation today, I'm going to share some of our experience in the QA and QC monitoring in LCMS analysis. So uh, first of all, is, uh, some of our introduction to our hospital, that is the Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. So uh, we, are, we, are, we were established in 1984, and we are serving a population of about 1.3 million. And the specimen throughput is uh, quite uh, not that large, about 3,000 something per day. And uh, we have a biomedical mass spectrometry unit stationed there, which is uh, equipped with about 10 LC MSMS, both triple cord and TOF instrument. And we are covering quite a large, uh, wide scope of service. And uh, in this presentation, uh, we will talk about some of our experience in the QA monitoring using LCMS. So uh, particularly, we will be uh, covering some of the uh, items here. That is the unratio, the monitoring of the internal standard, and material commutability, and also the uh, interpretation of the profiling test. Right. So uh, first of all, uh, what is so special about LCMS, especially in the clinical setting? So uh, in a certain sense, uh, this is a very expensive and fancy detector, and it provides a very specific measurement of the analyte. Now, uh, LCMS is not used mainly for the sensitivity. No, uh, for sensitivity measurement, uh, ELISA or other immunoassay will provide a much better measurement. But LCMS, the string for the instrument is the specificity. So the risk of false positive appearance is quite low, but it's never zero. Right? Uh, LCMS gives us a lot of information, uh, so the interpretation must be re done very really carefully. Now, uh, most of the ASA provided on LCMS are laboratory developed the tests instead of the in vitro diagnostic. So uh, in, if anything happened to your ASA, you cannot blame the vendor because they only provide you the instrument and the laboratory is solely responsible for the LDT. Now, most of the test is done manually on uh, LCMS, and uh, to us humans, right? So uh, the operator is uh, one of the variable that is uh, inevitable. Uh, we always have to take into account the operator, including the training and also their uh, specialty. So uh, on the LCMS platform, uh, we commonly measure some of the uh, drugs or steroids in the plasma or serum. These are the common analytes. Uh, also, there are some uncommon analytes encountered on LCMS, like the uh, uncommon steroid, like the oxidation product or metabolite, like glucuronide or uh, 
metabolite of vitamin D, and also some of the uncommon TDM drugs or measurement, like the free drugs measurement. Uh, these are not commonly found on the immunoassay platform or in visual diagnostic. So uh, these are the main areas that uh, main, a lot of the LDT are being developed. Now, of course, there are some legendary analyzes that is uh, only possible for it, uh, to be measured by LCMS, like the structural isomer of some of the sugar, uh, protein variants, isoforms, or even some degradation products. Now, uh, this requires a very specific measurement to avoid cross reactivity in the immunoassay. So when we go down the list, uh, these analyses are more likely to be done by LCMAS. But uh, of course, it will be much more difficult for quality assurance because of the lack of the standard. And also, the tests become much more complex. Now here's a very simplified uh, fishbone, fishbone diagram showing all the parameters that may affect the measurement in the clinical mass spec, from pre-analytical measurements to the LC separation, data review, and reporting. So uh, first, we'll take a look at the sample preparation. Now, most of the steps are done manually. So the staff training and pipetting and whatsoever play a big role in the quality of the LC mass assay. Uh, since the tests are LDT, so the reagent and material quality must be, uh, must be really uh, secured to, to ensure a quality result. Also, uh, the LC mass may have some unique uh, quality control policy. So uh, that we will cover later on. LC separation, again, uh, consumable pair brick parks in this, in this uh, particular parameters. Uh, peak shape and retention time are also some of the things that we need to look out. MS detection, uh, signal intensity and stability, of course, is very important uh, within batch or between batch. Uh, qualitation of the detection, uh, that is the use of the iron ratio, and also the matrix effects are also some of the important parameters. Now, Data review is uh, one of the most critical parts in the entire workflow because uh, we need to know what parameters are important and what are not because the LC mass is giving us a lot of the parameters. So uh, we need to stratify some of the importance of these parameters in order to have a very efficient uh, quality assurance policy. All right, so here is a very uh, typical uh, data review for a uh, quantitative assay. Uh, in this case, we are measuring the dihydro coding uh, of course, uh, in the analysis, we have a set of calibrators. Uh, in this here, here is uh, eight level calibrators, two set of QC, and then some of the unknown sample. Now, in this table, it shows a lot of the uh, LC mass parameters. But uh, usually, uh, the things we look at is the iron ratio, uh, the IS area, sorry, the internal center area. So uh, we have to have a very steady IS area. And then the concentration of the samples. And uh, in, in the following few slides, I'll share some of our experience in dealing with some of these, yeah, particularly the uh, internal standard and also the iron ratio of the detection. Okay, for a triple quad assay, the, uh, we are measuring the analyte based on the Q1 and Q3 uh, mass channel. So uh, we'll select the parents on the Q1 and then select the daughter on the Q3. So the uh, parent and daughter uh, pair is called the MRM channel. And for a measurement of an analyte, usually we'll be measuring two MRM. So the iron ratio is the signal ratio between the two MRM transition. That, that is basically the measurement of the two different fragments from the same parent's molecule. So uh, if the molecule is uh, correct, the detection is specific, then the iron ratio should be quite consistent across different uh, samples. But one thing we need to we need to look out is that the iron ratio is a concentration dependent. So when we go down the concentration, and we, when the concentration approaches the error OQ, of course the iron ratio will fluctuate a little. And also the different analyte may have a different uh, behavior in the iron ratio fluctuations. Now in this slide, uh, here's uh, some of the iron ratio uh, distribution for some different molecules, like uh, vitamin D3, uh, methanephrine, uh, small peptide like angiotensin 1, and also steroid like uh, angiotensin thione. And and at the first look, of course, uh, we see a lot of uh, dis different uh, distribution in the iron ratio. Some of them are quite precise, uh, like the vitamin D3 and methanephrine as well. And for the peptide, like angiotensin 1, the distribution is a little bit wider. And angiotensin-dione, uh, we measure the concentration at a very low nanomole or even picomole range. 
So the iron ratio fluctuates quite a lot and follow quite a uh, normal distribution pattern. So uh, when we devise a cutoff or acceptance criteria for iron ratio, we need to consider different behavior in different molecules. And uh, our range does not always mean uh, interference. Uh, we have to interpret the iron ratio uh, according to the concentration or some analyze specific uh, parameters. But it is a very, still a very useful parameter in some cases. And here is our experience in the measurement of the uh, testosterone and dihydrocodone in the serum. And uh, what we encounter is then incompatible EQA materials, and we identified this problem based on the iron ratio analysis. So the measurement of the testosterone and DHT is quite simple, actually. We do a simple liquid liquid extraction, discard the serum protein, vacuum dry the extract, and then do the LC mass analysis. And then the result obtained is shown here. The first uh, row is the uh, internal standard, the isotope labeled the internal standard DHT. And the second and third row are the different MRM channels for the dihydro, uh, testosterone. Now for standard and uh, patient serum, the peak uh, detection is quite discrete. So the uh, the behavior of the serum and standard are quite similar. And then for the EQA material, and uh, we kind of see a uh, dihydro testosterone peak here at the same retention time as the internal standard. So well, maybe this is the target we are looking for. But then when we look at the iron ratio, we see that the, the, the EKP material is quite different to that of the patient and standard. While the peak detection at that RLT is, uh, is quite reliable. So uh, the iron ratio suggests that there might be some interfering substance in the EKP materials. So uh, we in the alkaline wash step in our sample preparation, try and try to remove some of this interference and actually it's just a 0.1% ammonium hydroxide and followed by the another round of liquid liquid extraction. So uh, after the alkaline wash, uh, you can see the equilibrium material, the iron ratio kind of uh, return to normal compared to the patient and standard. And then without an alkaline wash, the, we can see that the peak detected here is actually not the testosterone. And then after the alkaline wash and based on the uh, correct iron ratio in the EKP material, the observed concentration is actually much lower when we uh, skip out the alkaline wash. So uh, the iron ratio in this case help us to identify the need and avoid a false detection of the dihydro testosterone. So uh, another uh, in our topics we would like to discuss is the uh, sample characteristics and how the uh, sample preparation procedure will affect the internal standard fluctuation. So uh, some of the common uh, matrix in the clinical laboratory is the blood or urine. Now blood, uh, some, of, some people may consider blood to be a more dirty or nasty matrix compared to urine because the blood is more viscous and contains a lot of protein. But actually in terms of the chemistry, the blood is a very predictable matrix because uh, all the blood are more or less similar. So when we take out a blood sample from your clinical laboratory, you can almost tell that it contains about 150 millimoles something sorts and uh, about 20 or 30 grams per liter of protein or, or whatsoever. So the chemical composition of the blood is more predictable. And compared to urine, the composition is uh, actually is quite uh, fluctuating and can be quite different between different patients. So uh, it's a much more unpredictable matrix, and it, it also gives us a lot of problem in the quality assurance in the urine test. Now here are some of the uh, common sample preparation strategy in the clinical mass spec uh, arena, uh, ranging from protein precipitation to liquid liquid extraction and then solid phase extraction. Now uh, the complexity will uh, we increase when we go down the list, right? Because in the protein precipitation, actually you are not extracting anything. You are just making a dilution. Liquid liquid extraction, uh, you are involving a more step. So you are extracting some of the unwanted component and the extract is a little bit cleaner. And the solid phase extraction is just another pre-column before you do the LC mass analysis. But the extract will be much cleaner compared to the other two approaches. But then uh, while the extract is cleaner, you're also introducing a lot of uh, variation during your sample preparation. And that may affect the, the uh, internal standard and other parameters. Right, the internal standard is kind of an internal calibration 
because uh, it, you introduce the inter internal standard at the start of your sample prep, and it will correct any uncertainty associated with the entire workflow. And most of the case, we use a stable isotope labeled analyte, so it has, it has the same chemical properties, but a different mass property. So the importance of the internal standard is that uh, we are relying on the IS signal for calibration. And the internal standard has a, has a reciprocal relationship with the concentration. So if there is an artifactual drop of 20% of your internal standard signal, then the observed concentration will increase by 25%. So the main uh, dilemma we are facing in clinical mass spec is uh, how to know if the internal center is working properly. So where is the line between a normal fluctuation of your internal center and an internal center failure, like uh, someone uh, basically pipette the wrong volume of internal center in a, part in a particular samples, or the matrix effect suppress the iron ratio, uh, suppress the iron internal center uh, signal to the point that it affects the concentration measurement. And some of the variations uh, include a human error or MS detectors or sample matrices also play a role in this uh, internal center fluctuations. So uh, we took a look at our own data and see how the internal center fluctuate within different batches of analysis. So what you are seeing here is the measurement of the uh, cyclosporin A in whole blood, uh, simple, very simple protein precipitation with organic solvents, and then do a triple quad measurement. So uh, you can see the internal standard uh, precision is quite good within each batch. Most of them are within 10% or even 5%. And even we took the overall uh, imprecision, the CV is only 6% 6 or something. So the precision is quite good. And mainly because the sample preparation is also very simple, right? And then we also look at uh, some of the uh, uh, internal center precision across different analytes, uh, serum margarine, protein sample, also by protein precipitation analysis. In precision, also quite good at about 10% something. Vitamin D is, is a small molecule, but then uh, we used a liquid extraction, so the variation was a little bit larger. In precision, it's about 15%. Urine metanephrines, again, uh, it's very complex uh, urine matrices coupled with an online solid phase extraction. So you can imagine there are a lot of variation in the sample preparation pro procedure. So the imprecision is, can be up to 70% in the internal standard. But even though the uh, fluctuation of internal standard can be quite large in different tests, but the problem is uh, how we can tell uh, that fluctuation is normal or is it working properly. So one thing is to compare the imprecision in the sample and your QC. So uh, cyclosporin A, the internal standard uh, imprecision uh, are quite similar in QC in your sample. IGF-1, vitamin D, and also methanestrin, the QC and sample are also very similar. So then we can check whether the QC uh, is uh, within range or out of range to tell whether the internal center fluctuation is, is, is uh, acceptable or not. And then another way is to look at the internal center trend during the analysis within batch. So what you're seeing here is the internal center trend in different tests across uh, six different batches. So uh, actually, the, even though the fluctuation can be quite drastic, the, the trend within each batch should be quite consistent. And then we need to take out some of the sample that fluctuate quite a little bit. So for example, for IGF-1, you can see some samples, uh, they deviate from the trend drastically. So we took that out and do the repair analysis and found that, oh, this was really an internal standard failure in some of this sample and causing a falsely high measurement in the concentration. Okay, so uh, we also look at the long-term measurement uncertainty in different assays. So even though the IS uh, imprecision is quite large in some of the tests, the long-term measurement uncertainty is, is actually quite good, actually. Most of them are below 8% or something. And we have the same performance in the EQA uh, program. So in this way, uh, we can tell that the internal standard imprecision, uh, they're doing their job, right? The internal standard fluctuate to correct for any variation in your test, even though some of them fluctuate at about 60 or 70% uh, CV percentage. But that uh, procedure or this practice relies solely on the computability of your QC material. That is the fluctuation of IS in your QC should be able to uh, mimic that of the samples. So this uh, brings us to the next topic.
that is the commutability. So the uh, definition of commutability is basically that the material of your QC or GQAP should have the same behavior as your patient sample in different assays. So in this way, your QC is monitoring the assay uh, correctly, just like your samples. Okay, so uh, some of the source of the QC materials uh, can be from a commercial source. They are mostly available for common analyte, but uh, they may not be designed for LC mass assay, uh, mainly because uh, they are designed for immunoassay or other platform. So we, at this, uh, in this case, we already have some computability issues. Uh, homemade material, uh, we can do the spiking uh, experiment to generate some of the uh, QC at our desired concentration. But for some of the endogenous analyte, like the uh, metanephrines or uh, urine cortisol, it will be quite difficult to obtain a suitable matrices or uh, patient samples to do the spiking. Sample reanalysis, uh, actually we are just picking out some of the old sample and then reanalyzing them to see if the accuracy or the result is consistent, kind of like the uh, incurred sample reanalysis. So they, of course they are totally matrix match, and they must be computable. But uh, we have the problem of the value assignment and how to establish the acceptance criteria. And the last result is to use the EQA material. Uh, actually, it's not, it's not feasible because checking your performance uh, using the EQAP material, but that should be an external quality assurance material. So you are checking yourself in this case. Okay, so uh, we will share two experience in the commutability of materials, and both of them are involved with the IGF-1 assay. So uh, first is the uh, observation of the oxidizer form in the EQA material. So uh, we found out that the uh, RCPA, the EQAP mater EQA material, actually has a very large amount of the oxidized IGF-1. So the oxidizer form of IGF-1 has a different master charge value in our assay because of the addition of the 16 delta. Now uh, here are some of the uh, mass spectrum in our QC, the patient samples, and also the uh, RCPA uh, materials. So the large peak here is the IGF-1, while the minor cluster of peak uh, is the oxidizer form of the IGF-1. So uh, the oxidizer form is actually not observed in the QC and sample, and it's only observed in the sustainable level, sustainable level in the uh, EQP material. So uh, what we have is here is that the correlation of the uh, EQP material between our platform and other immunoassay are quite different to that of the samples. So the native IGF-1, the level is about 80% of that of the immunoassay because immunoassay cannot differentiate between native form and oxidizer form, but uh, LCMS can differentiate between them. So uh, in order to have a good correlation between the two platforms, we have to combine the measurement of the native IGF-1 and then the oxidized IGF-1 together. And then we can get a good correlation between the two platforms. But that observation is only made in the EQP material because the oxidizer form was not observed in the patients. So the in this uh, this this is an example of the incompatible uh, non commutable uh, EQP material. And in order to have a uh, realistic interpretation, we have to uh, take into account of the oxidizer form. Okay. So the second one is the collaborator commutability and the value assignment. So uh, in order to do a proficiency testing for our IGF-1 measurement, we are sending out some of the patient samples to another laboratory for correlation. And we observed that, that the cycle one and two correlation has a very sustainable uh, high bias. So uh, we, there are two proposed actions. One is the correlation of the collaborators, and the second one is the continued uh, correlation of patient sample uh, for another cycle to see if this is due to, the, due to the imprecision problem in both the laboratories. So uh, first we send out a set of the collaborators to them and then do the reanalysis. And then again, uh, we, see, we saw that the correlation of collaborators is quite different to that of the uh, patient samples. So uh, in another laboratory, the uh, low bias is more, uh, more pronounced in the collaborators, but not that much for the patient samples. Now, uh, if we adjust our collaborators based on the correlation value, it will actually show a more drastic uh, low bias for the patient samples. 
uh, sorry, the high bias because they were assigning a lower value for the calibrators, which does not reflect that of the patient samples. So uh, the root cause uh, we identify is that the calibrators we use are actually an artificial matrix. That is a 4% DSA in PBS with the protease inhibitor. So it is not entirely matrix match with the patient samples. So in this case, the, uh, the calibrators is not commutable between the two laboratory. So uh, when we do the value assignment based on the correlation experiment, we need to be very careful because we may uh, introduce uh, another problem to the patient samples instead of correcting some of the uh, bias. Okay, so uh, now we move on to our uh, uh, last topic in this presentation. That is the small molecule profiling in the clinical mass spectrometry. Now the strength of the uh, uh, LCMS is that the LC can separate a lot of the small molecule along the uh, chromatographic gradient and then the very specific measurement individually. So uh, this is a very uh, powerful technique for the quantitative measurement like the plasma amino acid or serum acylcartins or very long chain fatty acids because uh, now most of the tests are related to IgM that is a pediatric patient and uh, the, the sample volume for a pediatric patient is actually very small so uh, we, not, we want to maximize, maximize the yield of the uh, test in a small sample so uh, the LCMS is, uh, is the most preferable option because uh, we can measure a lot of things in this small amount of the uh, blood volume. Now, uh, small molecule profiling uh, may also be applied semi-quantitatively, like for the measurement of the urine organic acid. Now, uh, in this uh, typical uh, test platform, we are commonly measuring like more than 30 or 40 analytes in a single run. Like uh, we are measuring more than 35 amino acids in a single run. And uh, it's kind of the move on move into the arena of the metabolomics analysis. Now, uh, one thing about this uh, metabolomic analysis is that uh, most of them rely on the pattern recognition and not just a single number. So unlike uh, the, the renal function or liver function, right, we are not looking at individual single number. We are looking at the variation or the level of the different amino acids as a whole. And uh, this pattern recognition is used to differentiate between normal and disease. Now, uh, in the traditional QC rules, we are looking like the uh, multi rule like 22S or 13S. But uh, if we apply that rule to the profiling test, that will be a problem. Because if we assume a QC acceptable criteria is uh, plus or minus 2SD, then it's about 95%. Uh, 95% and all analyzed behave independently. Then if we measure simultaneously 35 analyte in run analytical run, then actually the probability of observing one out of control event in one QC sample is not 5%, it's actually 31%. And observing two events is about 27%. So the probability of actually a false alarm is much higher compared to a single analyte measurement. So uh, our laboratory is doing quite a large number of these tests and usually uh, in each analytical one, we'll usually observe one or two analyte out of the uh, 2SD criteria. So the next question is, uh, shall we stick with the traditional Westcott QC rule or multi-rules? Okay, so uh, these are very general multi-rules. Uh, most of us are quite familiar with this, right? 1-3-S or 2-2-S. Uh, R4S or 10x rules, they are used to uh, interpret your QC uh, initial analytical run. Now, when we go back to the original paper in Westcott, the Westcott multi rule is not a really gold standard or uh, uh, all levels you should follow, right? The multi rule is to provide a simple data analysis and display while the control charts. And the main idea is to reduce the level of false rejection while improving the capability of detecting analytical errors. So kind of like the reference interval interpretation is a balance between sensitivity and specificity of your essay. Now, when we go to the, uh, in the some of the standard or EQA provider of the uh, IEM analysis, so we can see that uh, most of them uh, have, some of, have some policy or suggestion on your QC rules, but they also highlight that the result of your, the, the goal of your analytical measurement is to make a correct diagnosis or correct interpretation of your result 
regardless of the location where you perform the test. So at the end, it's the uh, interpretation that matters, but not individual values. Now, when we look at some of the common profiling tests, uh, we can we can compare the measurement and uncertainty of an uh, individual analyte and what uh, we are looking for in the clinical interpretation. So for most of the uh, analyte measurement uncertainty, we can keep most of them below 10%, including amino acid and very long-chain fatty acid. But then when we look at the individual analyte in this uh, in different tests, for example, the phenylalanine, Right, we are what we measuring. Why we are measuring phenylalanine is because we want to pick out the PKU. But the, in the PKU presentation, the level is about two to three fold of that of the upper reference interval, upper normal of the reference interval. And there are also other parameters that we can take into account, like the phenylalanine to tyrosine ratio, alo isoleucine, uh, the the diagnosis of MSUD. Again, two to three fold higher than the uh, upper limit of the reference interval, together with some of the elevation of branch chain amino acid, right? Citrulline, again, almost 20 fold higher than the RI, and with the gross elevation of ammonia, right? Acyl cartin, C3 cartin, at least two to three fold, right? So, so on and so on. So uh, in the in the IEM uh, diagnosis or surface, so uh, most of the analyte we are looking at are not just one or two units higher than the reference interval, but at least two to three fold higher. So in that case, it's 5% or 7% uh, measurement uncertainty, or when we apply that to our 2SD rule, does it really introduce a lot of risk to the patient inter uh, result interpretation? Now, uh, in the clinical laboratory, now we are talking more and more about risk management. So we are basically categorizing the risk uh, based on the frequency of the occurrence and the uh, and the criticality of the event, and of course in IEM most of them might be uh, critical or catastrophic if we miss some of them. But then uh, we also need to take into account different analyte and how frequent they uh, they will give us an out of control event. So uh, here's some of a uh, a very simplified table showing some of the analyte. So uh, this is for reference only, right? Uh, I'm not suggesting that you should strictly follow, right? But uh, most of the analyte, they are they are not critical, and for critical one, I I, I totally agree that they they have, should have a, a more rigorous control in the in the QC and QA procedure, like alloazolusin, phenylalanine, or C3 and C5 or short chain carotene. Some of the analyte also are quite serious, like branching amino acid, uh, arginine, or multiple long chain fatty acid. Uh, acyl cartins, glycine, right? But uh, you may relax a little bit because uh, the disease they are associated also has other uh, biochemical markers that may help in the differentiation. Now, uh, other analyzes are the, the criticality is a little bit minor, like the individual long chain acyl cartin or uh, or other amino acids like histidine or aspartic acid, because the isolated increase or decrease in this analyte are not specific to the uh, IEM. So the risk of uh, missing some of the diagnosis is quite low, even though the analyte show a out of control event. So in this case, you can stratify the, uh, the analyte and devise an individual uh, QA and QC procedure to minimize the false rejection. Okay, so uh, this is uh, my last slide in this presentation. So uh, LCMS fundamentally is quite similar to a chemistry analyzer, just a fancy detector, but the interpretation of the readout should be a little bit more uh, careful. In general, it's not an individual diagnostic test, so a human input is essential. Right? You, we, we cannot avoid human input or devise a totally uh, logical uh, QC policy in the LCMS. You need to have some human input in the interpretation. So a quality assurance is also more than just a QC chart. We have a, we need to have an understanding of the platform, the capability, as well as the limitation of uh, what it can or cannot do. For the multivariate analysis, like the profiling test, so uh, we are facing a hundreds of measurement, and while uh, all analyzes are equal in the profiling test, so, but some analyzes are more equal than others, right? Compromise uh, has to be made if we want to ensure the efficiency while maintaining the specificity of the assay. So the ultimate goal here is to minimize the patient risk and false alarm while maintaining the efficiency of your uh, platform. 
So uh, that's the end of my presentation. So uh, thanks very much for your attention. And thank you, Dr. Kam, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. <clears throat> so it looks like we already have some great questions coming in from our audience. Let's take a look. Our first question, what are the most important parameters that you feel when it comes to QAQC monitoring of LCMS analyses? Hmm. All right, so uh, when we come to LCMS uh, analysis, uh, what I will look for mainly is the uh, internal standard area and also the uh, retention time. But uh, in terms of these two parameters, what I'm looking for is mainly the consistency within each batch of the analysis. So I won't expect to see one or two sample uh, suddenly, for example, the retention time or uh, internal standard area fluctuate, suddenly jump to another RT or that is not consistent with the entire batch or not consistent with the QC. So uh, between batch, uh, the consistency is uh, less of a concern, but uh, within the single batch of analysis, I'll expect these two parameters to be uh, quite consistent. And for the uh, profiling test, uh, what I'll be looking for is mainly the, just as I mentioned previously, some of the uh, more critical analyze and also the overall interpretation. So uh, for the profiling test in the, in the when we do the QA policy, so uh, we, we will also introduce some of the QC. But uh, the QC is not mainly just to monitor the individual uh, concentration of analyze, but uh, more on the interpretation. Like for example, in the, when we add the QC to our, let's say, human organic analysis, analysis. So it would be best if we include one or two positive, uh, uh, positive uh, patient samples. For example, a patient with the uh, propionic acidemia or guterra aciduria type 1, and see if in that analysis we can still pick out some of the critical and, uh, and make a correct interpretation. So uh, these, are, these, I think, is the most important parameters uh, in the LC mass analysis in clinical setting. Thank you so much, Dr. Kam. And mm -hmm. Dr. Kam, how does your laboratory review and authorize patient results? Well, uh, in our laboratory, uh, when you, the technical staff uh, will mainly do the basic review on all the uh, parameters and analysis. For example, the uh, and also the basic uh, LCMS readout, and then the interpretation or the authorization of the patient result is usually done by a uh, specialist like pathologist and also uh, LCMS scientists. Uh, because the interpretation is mainly, uh, we have to take into account a clinical background of the patient. And as a scientist, we have to advise the pathologist, the limitation and our uh, LC mass platform, the, the capability and limitation. So uh, the basic review is done by technical staff and then the authorization of the patient result and report will be done by pathologists and specialists. Thank you so much. Now, what EQA schemes do your lab participate in? Mm, well, for a uh, general uh, quantitative essay, uh, we mainly participate in uh, RCPA EQA from Australia. And uh, for some of the IEM tests, uh, of course, we join the uh, ERDIM, the EQA scheme, because they provide a very comprehensive uh, EQA scheme for urine organic acid and other rare tests like transferring cargo form analysis. Right, so uh, these are the main uh, EQA scheme of our laboratory. Thank you so much. And we have one more question coming in. Dr. Kam, what is the differences versus other platforms when it comes to QAQC? Well, uh, when compared to other platforms, uh, the LCMS is actually uh, much more complex in terms of the readout. So uh, the main difference we face when we do LC mass in clinical setting is the information overload, actually. For example, in a simple uh, concentration measurement analysis, the, the readout of an analysis will include tons of parameters for individual uh, patient samples and also the QC. So we need to 
uh, have a very comprehensive understanding of the platform to see which one is important and which one is not. And compared to other uh, RVD platform like the automated analyzer, usually the readout is much more simple. So the you can check the basic parameters, but they, they won't uh, generate a lot of data or parameters for you to manually look through each one of them. So I think this is the most important difference between these two platforms. So uh, for LCMS SA, so uh, we really need to have a very solid scientific understanding of the platform in order to make a correct QA policy. Dr. Kam, I want to thank you for your presentation today. Do you have any thank final you. comments you'd like to provide for our audience before we go? Well, uh, for the audience, uh, I think LZ mass, uh, right in clinical lab, we are talking about M&M, &M, right? Mass spec and molecular. So mass spec is also getting attraction in the clinical laboratory. So uh, I, well, I hope that in the future, there'll be a more and more innovative test or platform in LCMS that may benefit the patient, especially the, the specificity provided by LCMS is really powerful in the clinical settings. So uh, hopefully we are moving forward to a, to a uh, better platform and more uh, advanced technology that may help the clinical diagnosis of the patients. Dr. Kama, I want to thank you again for your important research and your time today. I'd also mm -hmm. like to thank Labroots and our sponsor, Waters Corporation, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone, and bye-bye. Bye-bye.